so I think it would be best actually to start a little bit, Scott, if you don't mind, with uh, your story. Um, because not everybody who works in tech goes on to start a center <laughs> in terms of uh, a multiversity center. Uh, and I'd love just to hear how that path uh, started for you. So um, you're at Juniper, uh, you having different roles. Uh, if I remember right, your father passes, and this kind of igni ignites a new interest of yours, or how would you describe the change you went from running uh, a large corporation to then exploring what we might call the human potential movement? Um, or was this always an interest of yours and now you finally have time to put towards it uh, more fully? Uh, no, that, that's giving me way too much credit. Uh, so my, my dad died in 2004. And uh, when he did, it, uh, you know, I think about it a lot still, and it, it was uh, what I call this, um, brutal confrontation with mortality mm -hmm. and uh, and this question that surfaced that day <clears throat> didn't really surface for the first time but it resurfaced and uh, the question is what matters and for the 45 years or so leading up to that day I was able to defer that question mm -hmm. because even though I couldn't answer it you know, instead or in the meantime, I could go to college or get a job or buy a car or buy a house or whatever. Um, so I did all that stuff. But then when that day came, the question wasn't available. I couldn't go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like it created a discovery that day. In fact, I spent most of the next five years, I'd say, uh, trying to do what I always did, which is pretend like I could handle it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that for me translated into I know what to do mm -hmm. and I don't uh, need anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in 2009, I finally replaced myself as the CEO and acknowledged for the first time that uh, I do need help mm -hmm. and that I don't know. Uh, so anyway, not to wander too deeply into that, but that was the that was the path that. Uh, his passing sent me on. Beautiful. And I know a big part of that path has been uh, what we might call authentic relationships. And I'm wondering um, why that particular component. I mean, I know you're also interested in meditation and have your own your inner practice, but it feels like both with 1440 and your own journey, uh, authentic relationships is a, is a kind of key component. And I'm wondering why, why that as a particular uh, focus. Yeah, where did that come from? Well, it, <clears throat> it, it happened during that five year time because I had to figure out what to do at work, not to learn about authentic relationships, but because the company had gotten too big to do anything with that I could really affect with my own two hands. You know, there were thousands of people and billions of dollars and stuff going on all over the place. And so what was I gonna do? Um, and what that led to was a pursuit of leadership development. And what I was taught was that which I didn't know until then, uh, was that nobody uh, cares what you know until they know who you are. And, and so first you need to know, or at least have a clue. Uh, and then you need to have the courage and the authenticity to share it with other people. So we started doing a lot of development work and it wasn't the traditional kind, it was uh, sitting in circle uh, cutting up magazines with magic markers and boards and making lifelines and collages about ourselves and telling stories and laughing and crying and mm -hmm. learning and all of that really in the professional sense, although most of it was pretty personal, um, results in being able to curate an environment of trust, which has a lot of... Uh, importance in lots of domains. 
but for us it was really a way to build relationships that we could trust so that we could make simple agreements for what to do and we could get better outcomes. Um, but that was really the birth of it for yeah, me at right. least was in, was in leadership development. Yeah. And so uh, the birth of mul the multiversity, uh, you started the 1440 Foundation, I don't know, was uh, distributing grants to kind of support this community and to support a lot of the nonprofits that were working in this field. What inspired you to take on the much larger task of actually building a center? And you can you say a little bit about the name 1440 Multiversity and how might that differ from, let's say, a university or a different kind of other place of study that are more traditional in our society? Um, there's a lot there. Uh, so what, when I stopped being CEO, the, my Joni, my wife, also was raising most, mostly uh, raising our kids in, 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 while I was struggling with all these things, and uh, she uh, fell in love. Fortunately for me, it was with John Cabot Zinn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> so, and he's hard to reach. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> he's hard to compete with too, <clears throat> actually. Um, and, and so her pursuit of meditation was her own journey, and mine was really developed to try and build self-awareness in order to, to, to further this effort of authenticity and leadership and so forth. But what we decided in starting the foundation was with this work, was, it wasn't just about leadership development, and it wasn't just about an individual thing. It was the opportunity to bring that or help that come to the world. And so um, Joni named the foundation, 1440 is the number of minutes in a day. And it's really meant to uh, remind us to be present because that's actually a lot of minutes. <laughs> um, and if we could spend each one in presence, then um, there might be a lot more to be had in any given day. And we started the foundation uh, around grant making because we got a great piece of advice in the beginning, which is uh, first thing you should do is don't do anything. Just go find out what people already working are already doing. And that leads to the discovery for us of you know, hundreds of wonderful teachers, many of whom, um, I mean, not just John, but the other people that are uh, up on this stage over the last three days and the last several years. Um, so we made a lot of grants, and then we had this opportunity, <clears throat> which really kind of felt like something that we were told to do, because this Bible college was shut down in the Redwoods in Santa Cruz after 50, almost 60 years of operation. And there was this 75 acre school ground in the middle of a Redwood forest that nobody knew what to do with. <clears throat> and it really didn't cost very much <laughs> then. Uh, <laughs> to, to, and it was only 20 minutes from our house. So, and it was actually the way we found it was Joni's schoolyard friend from the third grade bought a house 500 yards from it. <laughs> and Joni was driving back and forth to see her friend and we were trying to figure out what to do next. And all of that led to the formation of this place we call Multiversity. Uh, <clears throat> and in the, in the design and the architecture of it, one of the things we've thought a lot about is there's a big difference between traditional... Uh, teaching and what at least we believe embodies all of this. One is, which is one of the things we wrestled with, is does the world need another brick and mortar place? You know, we could take all these resources and effort and build an online virtual whatever. Uh, and there's lots of people doing that and it's great work. Um, but it's kind of it's something Dan was talking about yesterday. You know, this energy, this thing that's really real between people in person. Uh, isn't substitutable. And the immersion of going into a learning experience, at least for us, has had dramatic impact relative to whatever you can read or see online. So it's not an instead of, it's an and to do that. And the difference between a university and a multiversity is in the university system, and this will be a little bit unfair, but it's kind of a hierarchical thing. Um, because it's, it's teachers who know things that you don't know teaching them to you. 
right? And that's not a bad way to learn chemistry or English or math. Um, but in this work, and I think at least the teachers that I know would be the first to say this, it's not about them teaching us something they know that we don't know. It's about them helping us to find out what we know and maybe can't find. Mm. And so that's a really different mm -hmm. model. It's very, and, and we might not even learn it from the teacher. We might learn it from the person we sit next to in circle. Or we might learn it from a walk in those redwoods. Uh, and so that translates into having to design the whole place differently. Mm -hmm. Because it's not a sit in a lecture room and talk down to a group. Nothing against that, though. Yeah. Not, <laughs> not, that again? not that there's anything wrong with that. that Seinfeld said? Um, and that's a great way to be taught intellectually and in physical education, maybe. It's maybe not the best way to be taught emotional, relational, spiritual. And for us in trying to develop the whole person, this integrated learning, integrated self, <clears throat> it, it's important for the design of the place to support, <clears throat> excuse me, to support the way that you're learning and what, what you're learning from yourself and from those around us and in community. So multiversity is really meant to be um, capturing a lot of things learning about all of the multiple aspects of ourself, learning it in a way that we can be embraced and held by the place that offers it, mm. along with the people uh, that come there, and, and then being able to, to develop this integrated self of multiple dimensions. Mm -hmm. you know, was, I think it was Jewel yesterday that said, you know, I don't want to balance between personal, professional, and that feels like something I could fall down from. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to be a person with both feet on the ground. Harmonizing. Harmonizing, yeah. I think she said. Personal life, professional life, family life, um, emotional, relational, intellectual. That's a very collected, integrated, grounded whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that the architecture of the campus support that. And the design of the place, the, the healing arts location, the redwood forest, the paths, the outdoor classrooms, the amphitheaters, um, the, the whole thing. It's, right, it's very, right. at least as best we can come up with, it's the most thoughtful way we can imagine to, to make that invitation and that container work. Beautiful. That's way to say it. Um, hopes and fears. <laughs> Do you have a sense of what, in your wildest dreams, if you have them, what it might be, or fears of, uh, I think you had said, you told me before, well, one fear is that nobody will come. That's the biggest fear. <laughs> is yeah. that the biggest fear? <clears throat> what, what but if already some come? people are coming, but that not enough people will come or that it won't serve that, that vision you have of a human connection establishment? Well, uh, it's kind of like, you know, if you've ever, whenever, you know, we may have a party and <laughs> eight o'clock comes and it's supposed to be the start and there's nobody there but you. <laughs> like, we really hope that doesn't happen. Uh, but there's so many great I mean, teachers coming yeah. at Bradloff, some of the names of people we've seen visit today. I mean, Dick Schwartz is Dan Siegel, Sharon Salzberg, and some people that aren't here, Richie Davison, and others that are. It's been so great to have the support of people that have said, we'll come and help you mm -hmm. um, do this. So uh, it, it's really, I guess if there's a hope, what I say the hope for it is, you know, it's probably, I, I hope for it to do, to bring things that I can't imagine yet, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, because it's an organic place. It's interesting how it's evolved. It started um, as this thing that we had an idea of doing. And it's grown into this thing that has a heartbeat all of its own mm -hmm. because of the people that are going to be there and the programs and the things and, and the place, the way it's kind of told us it wants to be um, designed and done. And so uh, it's already bigger than, mm -hmm. than any one mm -hmm. contributor, and there's been lots of them. So my hope is that, you know, it's kind of like birthing or raising a child or a life or, you know, you want to see it go out in the world and prosper and do great things. Mm -hmm. um, Beyond whatever idea you have of what it could be, even. 
way beyond. Yeah. Uh, so it's our hope that it that it offers a place for people to come to, and you know this um, one one thing I've learned about uh, in the growth or development learnings I've had. Uh, there's a big difference between change and transition. Uh, change is doing the same thing on a different day. Uh, and, and at least for me, um, in the first 40 some years of my life, I did a lot of uh, the same things on different days. You know, adding this, adding that, doing this, doing that, and whatever. And it's kind of a uh, the different, one of the ways, one of the analogies, the difference between a change and a transition is uh, a transition is a one-armed trapeze act. Uh, so in a change, you can sort of hang on to the bar and you can grab a new bar and let go of the old one and hang on to another one and you can get a house and get a car and start a family and do whatever. And there are, it's not, obviously, there's nothing wrong with all that. Um, but in a real transition, it's a one-armed thing. And, and that means letting go without knowing maybe even where the bar is, but certainly without the safety or comfort of grabbing it before you let go. Right. And so one of those letting goes for me was the whole experience of, um, of loss and so forth. Yeah. Um, and this is another one. Mm -hmm. You know, we embarked on doing this, and now we're kind of letting go of, you know, the actually easy part, which is building it. Um, and now it's time to lean into and hope to find uh -huh. the next piece of it all. Uh, the easy part was building it the last two years? Yeah, I mean, it's been, <laughs> it's had its things, but it's not the, it's been great. It's been fun. Uh, it's been hard some days and some days really hard. Some of the latest rainy days really, really hard. Uh, <laughs> But it's also a place where, and, and our real intention is, we want it to be a place where you can come and let go of the bar. Hmm. And if you do, there's going to be a safe, intentional, loving, held community that will make sure that that's a wise, brave, courageous thing to do and it turns into a great thing in, in your life. Each in its own way to each person's choosing in the way that it, you know, it just meets you where you are. It isn't about what me or anybody there thinks it should be. It's all about what you want and we just want to have a space that when you let go, it's okay. Beautiful, beautiful. We are out of time, so thank you. Great, thank you. Hope to see you. Oh, oh yes. I, I'm sorry, I, yes. should, I forget one thing. Just in case this is of interest or use, in September we're having what we call a service week, and it's gonna be a whole week that's free and it's for nonprofits to come and learn about um, things like fundraising and strategic planning and leadership development and how to build stronger organizations. Uh, so if that's of interest or if you know someone for whom that's of interest, please, our website's 1440, it's easy to find. Um, please come and apply and let us know um, of your organization and what it's about because we're going to be hosting that for the week and we've got some great people that have volunteered their time to come and teach and learn and so if that can be uh, possible, please come and join us. And we'll, we'll also be doing an event there mid-December that we'll announce um, shortly. That's right. Soren's going to be teaching. So Great. Thank Great. you. Thank you.